So I said, uh, hello, my name is Jody. I am Mohawk. I was born and raised in Buffalo, New York. My family is from Pompege, better known as Pander Megan near Belleville, Ontario. Um, and I had a presentation, but we're having some technical difficulties. So the basis of my presentation, I also said I'm happy we're all here today, uh, for sure. Um, but the basis of my presentation um, was based, one of the prompting questions that was emailed to us was talk about your journey and how you got into fashion. And that was one of the more difficult questions for me to answer. The, the first thing I made was at three years old, I stapled together my mom's favorite pillowcase to make bikinis. So I've just always been making clothing items. I, I grew up um, sewing, doing beadwork, crochet. Um, what people in my family didn't know, I figured out how to do myself in the library and then just ran with it. And um, what I was going to kind of start my presentation talking about, or I guess I still am, there's just no images, uh, was a bit of context in Buffalo and how it's very different from here and why I do so much work and I'm so grateful for the community that I have here in Toronto. Um, Buffalo is notoriously one of the, it's on the top 10 every year for the past 10 years with the most racist, sexist, homophobic, uh, transphobic cities in the United States. And it's just an hour and a half over the border. Um, I am a PhD student and an instructor in multiple uh, undergraduate institutions in the Western New York area, so I teach Native American studies. Um, nobody knows what a boarding school or residential school is. Most people can't name the closest reserve to them, even though there's uh, five within a 40 minute drive of Buffalo, New York. Um, so you have kind of a very different context issue. And uh, a few years ago, I wanted to change the name of an island in Western New York. It was called Squaw Island. Um, and this should be, this isn't a, a word you should feel free to say, it should be the S word in your minds, right? Um, and so, I, it took about three years, but during this three year journey, what happened was I was assaulted, people followed me around grocery stores calling me a squaw, people threw cigarette butts into my infant child's stroller. And so I start with this story because it's important that when we're talking about appropriation, when we're talking about what we do know about Native people or what you think you know about Native people, is that these things don't happen in a vacuum. As mentioned with Thunder Bay, they have direct effects on modern people's lives, right? These things aren't many generations removed when we talk about boarding schools or banned languages. And so moving from the island situation, as I now call it, which to me was about building a relationship to shared space, place, and time in an urban area because I did not grow up on territory, um, I turned to doing public art. Right, so I did an installation of our Thanksgiving address at this beautiful um, scenic locale. Um, and as I'm doing this installation, collaborating with a non-native person who is now my friend, I realized the importance of having meaningful relationships with non-native people, right? I saw her actively picking up the labor of talking to non-indigenous institutions to find this funding, of explaining the historical context of why this is important. I saw her doing the work that was too emotionally draining to be doing because I do it every single day. I do it when I teach, I do it with my friends, and I do it with the non-native side of my family. And so moving from these installations, I realized I needed, I needed a network of support of strong urban indigenous people. And I found that here in Toronto through Setsune, which Sage um, and Erica were doing for a time. And it was there that I found people like me who who knew our stories were not so unique, who understood that while we had our traditions, while we understood the importance of, of ceremonial clothing, of carrying these items with us, that was not all that we were, and that, and that even our ceremonial clothing, again, as mentioned by Riley, these were things influenced by Victorian modesty, right? There's no seed bee bush like growing in the world, right? There's no, there's no calico deer running around the forest to make a, a ribbon dress from. These, these ceremonial items that we have, these are stories of contact and resistance, right? Our ribbon, our ribbon clothes come to us because we were left with nothing. Everything was taken from us except for yards and yards of muslin. And so what did we do? We took that muslin, we made the best clothes we could, and we dressed them up with, with a bunch of ribbon that we have. So our clothing still, into this day, tells our stories. Much like we saw with those original pictures of those Apache children, those before pictures from before the assimilationist regime got to these 
very young children, our clothing tells a story about where, our, where we're from, about how our families love us, about how we love ourselves, and it's a language in and of itself. And it's a language that we are regaining. Um, not strictly in clothes that we wear behind closed doors in Haudenosaunee cases in longhouses, but we see people um, moving towards modernizing um, our, our traditional pottery designs that tell stories about how we plant things, right? So a lot of the work that I do in my personal work um, is screen printing, hand-drawn designs, um, so that we wear this not just as an emblem of pride, but as a conversation starter, right? It says the, the items that I design and wear, they communicate to other Haudenosaunee people, like I am here and this is who I am beyond my ribbon dress when I'm in ceremony. It communicates to non-native people around me that you do not understand everything that you see. You see this logo, you don't know what it is, you don't know where it comes from, you don't know what it means, but it's up to you to ask and to understand and to research. And so that's where I see um, modern, accessible, fashion items, accessory items, textile items as a means of resistance. The other part of resistance and resurgence in my personal journey is the skills in making and interrogating what I use. So I love beadwork. Who does not love beadwork? But these are tiny pieces of plastic that end up in the environment in some way or another as they fall into disuse, right? And so I, I love tanning my own hides, right, to move away from chemical chemical industrial processes of tanning hides. I do that in my backyard in Buffalo, New York. Um, I love returning to quill work, right? Um, so really figuring out how to use natural dyes, where, where our beadwork patterns come from are quills. And what's happened around that is my native and non-native friends have started to come over and help. As I started taking the community that I sought out because of the violence I was experiencing in Buffalo, New York and found here, and I'm building community in Buffalo, New York, not just between Native people, but between Native and non-Native people. And it's helping my non-Native family and my non-Native friends to understand how much support that we need to be able to not just survive, but to thrive. And that any kind of decolonial groundwork, you have a lot of groups using this word decolonizing, you cannot presume the naturalness of Canada, of the United States. There are people that aren't looking necessarily for full rights under citizenship, but that want to be able to exist as distinct entities with their own designs and ways of representing ourselves physically, artistically, and politically. Um, and some of my concluding slides were about an installation I did at the Mushbowl the, for the, um, it was called the Mushbowl Project. And um, I based it on the uniforms kids wore, and it was a three-story installation. And uh, many people don't know this, but Canada used to make the boys' uniforms out of rejected military uniform fabric. So it's scratchy wool. It smelled like mildew. Picturing a four-year-old wearing scratchy, hot wool in the middle of the summer practicing military drills with only one future in front of him. And it was important to me that people were able to touch these items, right? That they could feel how uncomfortable that was. That they feel, that they smell it, that you taste that thick air. But part of the project I did was to put medicine around these memories. And in every single item I make, I put in the headline, Traditional Haudenosaunee memory, uh, Medicine, because for me, it's protecting the memories of the ancestors that I think about that died to be able, for me to be able to learn my language, for me to have, to be able to tan a hide, for me to be able to use full work to communicate to other Native and non-Native people. Um, and with that in mind, I just encourage everyone in here to be open, to be okay asking questions, but to understand that, that there is so much work that needs to be done that we cannot do it alone. Yeah.